Ministries. Let's open with a word of prayer. God Almighty, we tell you we love you. We thank you again for what you're teaching us and for where you're leading us. Thank you for how you're changing our hearts and you're opening the way to freedom in each of us. Continue the work, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's uh, pick it up here. Refiner's Fire, uh, page 54. Um, understanding the purpose and the pain, um, James, a bondservant of Christ, a uh, bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The picture that you have there is a picture of a gold uh, ingot being refined. And so, you know, a, a friend of mine used to talk about this, and he talked about, you know, all of the impurities in the gold and how when they were refining gold, they would put, you know, uh, gold dust in or whatever, you know, gold they had collected and they would heat it up and they would bring it to the molten state. And then once it was melted down, it would take a while, but you had to leave it molten long enough for all of the impurities to float to the top, gold being the heaviest metal. And so pretty soon, you know, depending on how many, how many impurities in the gold, you could have a layer of impurities on the surface that would ab actually obscure the gold. Once it was separation was complete and all the impurities had floated to the surface, you would cool it down, you would scrape off the layer of impurities, and you would have a block of pure gold ready for the refiner's uh, use or for the jeweler's use. I think this is what... I experienced in the previous story. Why could I not pray it away right away? Because sometimes God leads us into those places of trial and pain because He's changing us. And character is one thing you can't just read and decide, I'm going to be more mature. You have to grow into that maturity. And so the pain we've gone through is important to our growth. In God's purpose to maturity, um, it takes time, right? And it's a process. One thing I've learned about, um, about uh, people in this whole process is I've learned that people naturally look for and demand fair treatment. I've learned that when we demand fair treatment, we demand something that's not in the heart of God. It's one of the things a lot of us struggle with. Who here thinks God's fair? Who here thinks God is just? Well, God is just. He paid for our sins on the cross, but God is not fair in the way that we understand fair. So when I'm going, I, I demand fair treatment. God's going, you really want me to give you what you deserve? I ain't doing that. I want to save you, forgive you, want to give you eternal life. So we go back to that value thing, right? But that's one of the things that we, hung up, we hang up on, you know? So if you're demanding fair treatment from God, it might be that the next part of your journey is to let that go. Put yourself in the hands of God and receive the mercy. Now, you know, you've got to understand, you know, if God's not fair... <laughs> God is not fair. God is merciful. The devil's not fair either. The devil's a predator. Uh, he does not follow the rules, and he will use whatever way he can to try to destroy you. But God will protect you, right? Uh, next thing I learned about forgiveness is it's an act of obedience oftentimes. You, you might not feel like it. You know, I don't feel like it's time. A friend of mine, I remember one time, he's a friend of mine now, he wasn't then, but he didn't like me. I was a young pastor in a church. This guy didn't like me. And he made it pretty clear he didn't like me. You are not to be the pastor of this church. What are you doing here? You know? I mean, he was very aggressive that way. And I didn't like him. You know? he, uh, he, he talked down to me in front of our staff, um, and I, I, I didn't deal with it. I thought, you know what? I don't feel like it's time today. So anyway, I never felt like it was time. Days went by, it didn't feel like it was time. Weeks went by, it didn't... Anyway, one morning I'm trying to write a sermon. I couldn't get the sermon. I kept looking at the phone. Terry, 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 Terry. Ter Terry kept coming to mind. I don't want to phone Terry. It doesn't feel like it's time. <laughs> Finally, it's like, okay, sermon ain't going well. Okay, Lord, the deal is this. If he answers, I'll go over. But he won't answer. I phoned him, he answered. Dang. Terry, can I come over? Yeah, you can come over. Click. Okay, well, he's not feeling too social. All right, I go over. He lets me in his house. I sit down on his couch, and he stares at me. And 
I look at them and I say, you know what? I said, I, I'm, I just came here to apologize for not dealing with this. I said, I know that you have issues with me and I'm sorry for not dealing with it. So forgive me for that. And I never got another word out. He started talking. I don't really remember what he talked about, but suddenly he became animated. And at the end of that little chat, he took me to the door. I went to the church. I wrote, the sermon seemed to come okay after that. I got up in the morning. I went to preach the sermon. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, throw that away. Okay. What am I doing? You're apologizing to the church. Why am I apologizing to the church? Because you held stuff against Terry and that... That, that hurt the church. That hurt these people. You limited them. So that's what I did. I got up and I said, I need to apologize to you as your pastor. And you could see the whole place just went quiet. <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> and they're thinking sexual stumblings. They're thinking, you know, extortion. They're thinking embezzlement. They're, whatever they're thinking. I said, I need to apologize for you because I held something between me, against me and another person in the church. I didn't deal with it, and I know it hurt the body. It hurt us. It put a cap on our growth. So will you please forgive me? And the whole place was silent. And then Terry stood up in the back. Hey, do you people hear the pastor? He needs us to forgive him. We're with you, pastor. He, he needs us to pray for him. Come on, who's praying for the pastor? A hundred people end up packing the front platform. They prayed the crap out of me. Um, and uh, we that pretty much wrapped up the service. And uh, it was funny because at the end of that service, this guy walks up to the front and approaches me. He's a friend of mine now, but he walks up to the front and he says, you know what? I haven't been in church in years. I like this. We are coming back. And that inaugurated a growth spurt in our church. And suddenly Terry was my best supporter. And I asked him later, I said, I said, what, what, what made the difference? He said, you humbled yourself. Hmm. You know, folks, this whole forgiveness thing, it's an act of obedience and you might not feel like it. I was just putting it off. What do you mean there, it isn't time? No, there might be a legitimate place, but you know what? You'll know it's not time instead of just escaping the responsibility, right? So make the choice, do it, and step forward. You know, somebody says, well, who, whose responsibility is, is it? Philippians 3, 12 to 14, not that I've already obtained, obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ. You know, this is so important. As we step forward to forgive, know this, you know, What's happening here? When we don't forgive, here's our guy. Boom, 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 right? Boom, boom, boom. And he's running like that. And he's running like that. And he's got his eyeball staring backwards like that. Anybody know what's going to happen to that guy? <laughs> he's going to smack into something and he's going to bleed, right? Uh, or he's going to run really slowly because he's terrified he's going to smack into something and bleed. When you look back and when you hold on forgiveness, you hang on to the past. And you cannot even enjoy the journey God has for you. And so the call that we have is to let go of the past. Leave it behind. I'm not perfect, but I know where I'm going, and I'm heading for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what happens when we forgive. We're free to enter into life. So what are you waiting for? Matthew 5, 22 to 24 says this, Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and there remember your brother is something against you, leave the offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present the offering. Anyone ever feel like, like why do I always have to do this? <laughs> There's probably reasons for that. I mean, me? I stick my foot in it a fair amount, right? Apparently, I need practice. Anyway, whatever. You know, but, but God always lays the initiative on us. Don't wait for the other guy. You do it. Okay? That's part of maturity. Okay. As we step forward into the next part, I want to take you to page 57, the follow three. 
So the follow through is now how do we engage a forgiveness process? How do we evaluate where we're at, where we're at as people who need to forgive? And how do we do this? Three focuses of forgiveness. The first is forgiving others. So people that have hurt you, we've already looked at uh, Matthew 6, 9 to 15, the teaching on the Lord's Prayer. If you don't forgive, you hang on to your garbage can, you're, you can't experience the grace of God. So what do you want, right? The next one is forgiving ourselves. Romans 8, 1 is a big one for me. I prayed this one at the top of my lungs when I felt like I was so awful, I'd stumbled so often, and I needed to remind myself that I am not condemned, right? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. Jesus has forgiven my sins. You know, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, it says, we hold on to our confession. Hold fast to that confession. What's the confession we hold fast to? I'm forgiven. He died for my sins. I'm forgiven. I don't care what I've done. I pooped my pants for the 65th time. Most children don't actually talk like this, but you know what I mean. I'm referring back to the diaper illustration. I'm not being thrown out of the family because of that. I'm still valuable. Hold on to that confession. The, the third focus is forgiving God. Now, has God ever done anything wrong? No. But bucket loads of people, you know, sign up for this walk with God. And they have this idea what God should be like, and God ends up not being the kind of God they want Him to be. So they get angry at God. So though God has not done anything wrong, you do need to deal with your anger at God if you're going to move forward. And so that becomes a part of the journey too. So gaining your own freedom, page 59. How do you do that? Step one, diagnose yourself. So here's a little bit of a questionnaire uh, thing. Um, do you have forgiveness issues? So you want to look for the evidence or the fruit of unforgiveness. And so I refer to the fruit of the flesh list in Galatians 5 as I build this list. Hatred and enmity with several focuses. Um, uh, Self-hatred. Do you hate yourself? Maybe you hate somebody else. Maybe you hate God. Right? It's interesting. Not everybody who hates God is an unbeliever. Some people are just angry at God. And as they resolve that anger, they go like, yeah, I always have believed. <laughs> okay. I mean, I was an angry teenager. I hated my dad. That didn't mean he wasn't my dad anymore, you know. So we have to resolve these things. Maybe you have jealousy and envy, you know, uh, betrayal of trust issues. Maybe you have thoughts of revenge, or maybe you're already beyond the thoughts of revenge and you're actively seeking revenge. Maybe you have strife that is personality-based. You've got somebody that just grinds on you can't, and you can't stand them. Why? Maybe you have anger, and there's different kinds of anger. Outbursts of anger, aggressive. This is a screaming, stomping, threatening, intimidating person. Maybe you have smoldering anger, silent anger. This is a passive person. Uh, I think about a friend of mine. He used to, he used to say he can stop time. Uh, well, I said, what do you mean you can stop time? He says, I shut down, I pull back when I'm angry at my wife. I don't talk to her for two days. I don't talk to her for two weeks. She never knows when I'm going to start talking to her again. Now, since then, thank God, he's grown up. He's allowed 30 minutes. You can sulk for 30 minutes, then we talk, right? Um, but he was, he was one of those passive-aggressive anger people. Maybe you have suppressed anger. I had a lady come to this uh, seminar one time. I'm here because of my husband. He's so angry. She gets done the seminar. She says, forget my husband. I'm here because of me. You know, when you have somebody that compensates for an angry person for so long and they suddenly don't have that angry person to compensate for anymore, and they begin to experience the loss, and all the years they gave up for that, they realize how angry they are. So maybe you have suppressed anger. Maybe you're a disputes or arguing person. Maybe you're a dissension or a faction or a taking sides person. Who here takes offense on behalf of other people? Look, you know what? He's my brother, and I can say what I want about him, but you can't say nothing, Right? I mean, you can take offense on behalf of all kinds of people, right? So, you might have forgiveness issues. Uh, maybe you have a sense of disappointment. You failed someone or yourself. Someone failed you. You feel God failed you. Maybe you're simply disappointed in the way your, your life has worked out to, to this point. You got some unforgiveness issues, eh? Maybe you have depression. Remember the woman we talked about earlier who, because she was so 
She struggled with such unforgiveness, she couldn't come near the cross. She did the false religion thing. It drove her into depression. Not all depression is unforgiveness issues, but it will drive you there. Maybe you have a low sense of personal worth because you failed, and you failed over and over again. Maybe you have an obsessive need for fair treatment or, or a sense that you've been treated unfairly. Maybe you have ongoing emotional pain over a failed relationship. You know, and you're obsessing in your head and you can't get free from that obsession. Maybe you have a tendency to avoid certain people. Maybe you have a tendency to avoid certain places because of who you could run into there. Charlie, you got any unforgiveness issues? Nope. Good. Let's go to, uh, for coffee at uh, Tim Hortons on 8th Street. Nah, I never go there because John shows up there. I thought you said you had no unforgiveness issues. I just don't like John. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about that, you know? Personally, I'm wondering about that. Anyway, you know? Uh, maybe you have a sense of being actively used or betrayed by yourself. It's interesting that you use and betray yourself. You can. By someone else, name them. By an organization, name it. I knew a guy who got raised in a parochial school, and he was abused there, and he was funny because he's Catholic. And so he went through some of that abuse that was in one of those residential schools. And uh, he, he hated the Catholic Church. Hated the Catholic Church. On the other hand, he loved Catholics. So it's like I'm going, where is that coming from? Well, he saw Catholics as victims of the machine. And so he loved Catholics because he has compassion because he wants to save them all out of the machine. But he hated the machine. Anyway, so he had, he had to forgive the Catholic Church, an organization, right? Um, step two. So once you've gone through this, you know, it's funny actually. I had a guy go through this a while ago. He says, I got it all. <laughs> What's wrong with me? I don't know, I had them all too, whatever, right? <laughs> Consider what carrying unforgiveness is costing you. What is it costing you to hold on to your grudge? Oh, I never thought of it that way. What's the trade-off, right? Uh, it can cost us our freedom from worry, trauma, bitterness. It can cost us relationships with sons, daughters, husbands, wives, friends, brothers and sisters at church, business partners, friends, and our sense of community. I mean, I think about one guy. His daughter betrayed him. He wrote her out of the will. And he went through an intersection, just about got T-boned and killed. And the thing, he came out of the, that almost near-death encounter, and he's going, I just about lost the last opportunity. I just about lost it. He went straight home. He went to his daughter. He said, I forgive you. Your life is your life. I'm not here to control it. And you're back in the will, and I just want the relationship back. What is it costing you? Right? There's a story in my book, uh, Forgiveness There, uh, Freedom Through Forgiveness, about Albert. Albert came to me after preaching on forgiveness one time. You saying I can't be forgiven without forgiving? I said, yeah. He couldn't wrap his head around that. As he stood there, read the whole story in the book, but as he stood there, you know, a young fellow came and pushed himself into our space. And he grabbed his dad by the hand and he said, Dad, I'm sorry, and I forgive you too. And he pulled the guy in, pulled the old boy into a hug. And after that, they ignored me. And they stood for the rest of that morning and got caught up on years of lost time. What had his grudge cost him? It cost him three years with his grandkids, with his daughter in law, with his son, family time together. You, you get what I'm saying, right? What is it costing you? You know, it costs us our view of the heart of God, the lost fruit of the Spirit, peace, joy, patience, this lost sense of God's presence. Remember Trina. When she went through her betrayal, that was the day that the intimacy with God was lost, the day she began to nurture the betrayal. Uh, so it leaves us with a sense of loss, of wondering what could have been if only. Who here lives with the if onlys? The shoulda, woulda, couldas. Oh, you gotta, you got to let go of that stuff. It'll torture you. Loss of intimacy in relationships, the ability to trust and the, and the ability to be trusted, right? A sense of belonging, a sense of safety, a sense of joy from family, friends, co-workers, a belonging. The loss we experience manifests in anger, cynicism, bitterness, hardness, a heart, depression, regret. I go back to my friend who said I got them all. He filled all these out too, <laughs> you know? Now what I want you to do, once you fill this out, you're going to assign value. What does that mean? Well, in light of this idea of 
what is it costing you to hold on to your grudge? Look at the value of your offense and the value of the sin that has been done to you. What has carrying it cost you? What have you lost because of it? Value it. Well, okay. You know what? I value my grudge more than I value my family, more than I value my grandchildren, more than I value my whatever, right? Now ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth it? I'm hoping you'd come up with the conclusion it's not worth it. But sometimes we haven't thought that through. You know, sometimes adding the eternal perspective is important. You know, and I, and I got this standing beside the casket of my brother. 32 years old, he died, he was handicapped, he's laying in the casket, I got my hand on his face. And I'm feeling the deadness and the coldness and the fact that he's gone. And suddenly I'm staring into eternity. I sense the presence of God and this, this amazing uh, sense of eternity. And I had been betrayed right around that time. And suddenly in the light of standing there with my brother who has just gone to be with Jesus and that sense of eternity, I just wish that the guy that had betrayed me, who I actually loved because he was a friend of mine, I wish he would have been there. I would have thrown my arms around him and said, it doesn't matter. Because in the light of eternity, it didn't matter. You get what I'm saying? I mean, think about of eternity. Think, it, think of it this way. Here's eternity, you know? Now, if I say 80 years, if I only think about my life as 80 years long, and I lose 10 years out of my life, that's a huge, big loss. You get what I'm saying? But if we say, no, no, we don't live just for 80 years, we live for eternity... It reduces, it changes the perspective on what's been done to us. You know, the perspective in light of eternity, what's been to, done to us doesn't really matter. And that's the way we're going to be when we get to heaven. It won't matter. I'm not trying to trivialize what anyone's gone through here when I say that. But the truth is the offenses we carry only matter within the framework of this world. So the application is change the framework and you change the offense's value and its ability to torment you. Well, step three. We want to remove the conditions and renounce your agenda, which basically means we're going to pray, Dear Lord Jesus, I'm ready to give up my demands on this situation. We're doing it your way. List your conditions. What are the conditions you hold? I will... If, right? So here's a little bit of a list, you know. Uh, if you're angry at God, maybe you've had these conditions. I'll let go of my anger or disappointment toward you, Lord, if you bring my spouse back, if you fix my child, if you allow me to be financially secure first, if you get me a good job, if I can keep my home, if you make my business successful, if you take away this hard time, if I don't have to give whatever it is up, fill in the blank. Maybe you're struggling with forgiveness towards somebody else. Well, you know what? I'll forgive Charlie if he apologizes, if he makes things right, if he returns what he took, if he takes back what he said about me. You know what? That was my thing with my friend who betrayed me. You know? And a little bit down below there. If people can know what has happened to me is not fair. I wanted to be justified in front of people. Right? So you go through that little list. You know, if I can get back what I've lost, if you make him pay for what he did, if I can only get fair treatment, if I can be justified in the eyes of others. Well, what about if you carry grudges against yourself? Maybe your conditions on yourself sound like this. I will forgive myself if no one knows about what I have done. If I can keep up my image, if I can keep this between you and me, if I can perform for you the way I want to or need to, if you heal me, if my faith can stay private, if I do not have to ask for help. You know, it's sort of, it's sort of funny, you know, I have people that come to me and they drive long hours to get to me, and I think, I think about a couple of them that I've asked, why did you drive so far to come and confess your sins to me? Because I can leave. In other words, they can confess what they've done to me, I can help them with the forgiveness stuff, and then they can leave, and they don't have to, they don't have to worry about having someone who knows what they did around. The funny thing is, after they get done confessing their sins, and they experience the forgiveness, they're going like, woohoo, I don't care anymore. Because because the pride is broken. The humility is broken. Humiliation is broken. The shame is broken. That's what forgiveness does. Anyway, you know what? Whatever your conditions are, write those, forgi those conditions down. So that's where I want to leave us right now. That's part one of the diagnostic process. When we come back, 
we are going to act on those processes. Let's close with a word of prayer. God Almighty, we tell you we love you. We thank you for this time as you show us whether or not we have forgiveness issues. Open our hearts. Help us be honest. In Jesus' name, amen.